What's up guys, how are you doing? We need to have a conversation about using the Apple Silicon Macs for software development. If you're a student, a budding software developer, or a software engineer, it's important to know whether the Apple Silicon based Macs are going to be enough for you to do all of your development on, or if there's going to be some roadblocks in your way. Keep watching this video to find out. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and like this video. It helps the video reach a wider audience and helps us build a community on this channel. The reason I wanted to make this video is because I wanted to dive a little deeper into the benchmark leaks that came out for the MacBook Air. We saw it on Geekbench, which is a tool used to determine how fast a processor is relative to others, that the new MacBook Air with Apple Silicon outperforms the highest end 16 inch MacBook Pro run running Intel Silicon. We also see it's getting very close to the performance of the iMac Pro and the Mac Pro that, that came out this past year. This is unheard of levels of performance. Before you jump on the hype train, we need to see if we can determine how good the Apple Silicon based Macs are going to be just from these CPU scores. After all, a computer is made up of more than one component and basing your decision to buy a new device based on a single ingredient is never a good idea, especially when that ingredient happens to be something so new and unfamiliar in the software community. So let's address the benchmark result first. The Geekbench score gave it a 1096 on the single core and a 6870 on the multi-core. These are very good numbers, but we can't just look at CPU performance to determine how good a computer is. What big limiting factor I see here is that the CPU test out of Geekbench doesn't really take the power of the GPU into account. Most of the older Macs, most Windows devices, and most Intel-based computers are able to be designed with a discrete GPU or integrated GPU based on your performance needs. If you're doing game development, machine learning, or anything that really requires a lot of parallelization and simulation work, having the ability to upgrade your GPU or add on an external GPU through the Thunderbolt ports is essential to be able to work quickly and effectively. I'm still not completely sure whether external GPU support is going to be coming to the new Apple, Apple Silicon based Macs like they exist on the Intel based Macs that are already out there. If any of you know the answer to this, feel free to share your thoughts down below in the comment section. The CPU and the GPU are not the only components that you should be thinking about. SSD speeds, expandable storage, the amount of RAM that's available to you, these are all important factors that will affect your purchase decision. Especially if you are doing development oriented or pro grade tasks, your needs are going to vary based on what type of workload you have. And in this early stage of the Apple Silicon Mac development, it doesn't seem that that level of customizability is available to us. For one, the unified memory on the Apple Silicon chips are topping out at 16 gigabytes for the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, and the Mac Mini, which is a bit of a concern if you are doing RAM heavy tasks that often come with modeling, simulations, or machine learning. This is often a big fear and a concern when you give one company too much control over the hardware you are using. Yes, there are benefits to one company dealing with every single subsystem that comes into their computer. You can see that Apple software and hardware divisions are working together to make sure that you're able to get the best performance out of your new Apple devices. One big problem with this is they get to decide what should be important to these devices, not you or me. Especially if you're part of the developer or the pro market, oftentimes you are a very small segment of the population that's buying these devices and these devices are not going to be built for you or me. For more consumer grade applications or for more creative tasks that are less concerned with the technical aspects of software development or of modeling, such as if you are doing video editing, in which case you want to abstract away as much of the hardware as possible and just have a good experience with video editing and to be able to edit videos fast, Apple has designed these systems to work very well for you. But if you are more into the development side of things, they haven't really mentioned how well their subsystems work for people like us. I mean, they did make a statement that TensorFlow is going to be GPU accelerated on the Mac, but as I have said in my previous video, that is only for inference and not for actual training of your machine learning models, which limits the usability of the neural engine for actual development tasks. It's meant more to be used by applications to accelerate some feature that they've already implemented, not to tinker around with those features yourself and me and, and implement those features yourself on these devices. I know that in professional systems, you would never try to do these big type of simulations, these train these big machine learning algorithms on your computer. But if you're a tinkerer, if you're a student, if you're a freelancer, you don't always have access to these resources. Having a computer that's a little bit more effective at doing those type of tasks that lets de developers and technical users practice and grow their skills without the cost constraints that come with using more powerful server on-demand computing elsewhere. These are some of the hardware limitations that I am concerned with when it comes to using the Apple Silicon based Macs for, for software development, scientific computing, or something alongside those fields. My secondary concern is with 
the software support. Apple has addressed this issue many times during their keynote. They brought forth the idea of universal apps. You can take the mobile version of apps and directly port them over onto your Mac. Xcode has also built in support for converting your old applications to the new Apple Silicon binaries. And then there's also Rosetta 2 that you can use to translate your own applications and, and maintain compatibility with the new devices. Although with a bit of a performance hit. What I'm concerned with is that this is going to work for more mainstream applications, applications that are vetted and used by a lot of people. But I'm wondering how this compatibility will translate for tools and software that developers use when they are building the software. A lot of developers make software that is not just for Mac-based devices. Sometimes they have to boot into Windows to make sure that their app is compatible in Windows settings too. And sometimes you need to be able to accurately profile how your app is going to work in Windows without taking the performance hit of going through virtualization. Apple has declared that they are supporting virtualization for Linux subsystems, but they didn't mention whether Windows is supported yet. Parallels Desktop has announced that they are working on a Parallels version of Windows that will run on Apple Silicon-based Macs, but that is still quite far away. And in the meantime, you essentially cannot test any application on a Windows-based environment using Apple Silicon Macs. So if that was one of the things you were planning on doing with your Apple Silicon Macs, I would definitely wait to make sure that the compatibility kinks are worked out. Another concern and another tool that's almost universally used by software developers is Docker. It seems right now that Docker is, is, is failing and crashing on Apple Silicon based Macs. Homebrew is another one where the full compatibility with Apple Silicon based Macs are still not implemented. So what does this all mean? If you are a more technical user of your computer, where you are interested in coding or software development outside of the Apple ecosystem, where you interact with non-Apple devices, the new Apple Silicon based Macs are not a place where you can easily do that, at least at the time of release. If you're a developer, if you're a software engineering computer science student, or if you're someone that requires scientific computing tools that are not really mainstream, then I would definitely hold off on buying an Apple Silicon based Mac. Because at the end of the day, yes, the Apple Silicon based Macs, the MacBook Air, the MacBook Pro, the Mac Mini, they're great value right now. Given the price, the performance that you're able to get out of them is extremely good. But at the same time, compatibility is king and no amount of CPU performance is going to matter if you can't run the applications or if you can't run the tools you need to do your job, to do your assignments, to do your research. So those are my thoughts on using the Apple Silicon Max as a developer or a scientist. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Make sure to like and subscribe this video. It helps to show this video to more people and helps build a community here on this channel. That's everything from me today. And remember to always keep learning. Bye-bye.